All right, hello everyone, and uh, welcome to this virtual lecture. Uh, we're going to finish talking about uh, bank risk and management today, um, and uh, wrap up uh, this conversation. Get us into a good spot heading into the exam on uh, November sixth. Uh, the exam will cover material up through the this chapter, but not uh, anything else, since we'll spend the next class as a um, mini lecture slash review session. So you may recall that uh, we were talking about bank risks uh, on top of liquidity, interest rate risks, uh, credibility risks, things like that. Banks also fa face operational risk, simply bad management, foreign exchange and geopolitical risk, market risks, uh, and uh, all sorts of different risks. This, of course, is no different than any other uh, business. But banks are uh, in a unique position simply because the entire economic system relies on the amount of liquidity uh, that's around. And so if there are bank uh, bank risks, bank uh, failures, uh, they can have very wide ranging uh, effects throughout the entire economic system. So the main way that uh, investors, that regulators focus on uh, bank management is via the income statement. The income statement of a bank, just like any other firm, uh, looks at revenues and expenses over a specific time period, usually a year. Now, as you'll recall from your economics classes, uh, economists look at both explicit and implicit uh, costs. So that is to say your monetary costs and your opportunity costs. Uh, there, of course, an accounting statement does not pick up on opportunity costs per se. Uh, so we are dealing just with explicit expenses, which may not necessarily tell the whole story, uh, but uh, are really the best that regulators have. So there are different parts of a bank income statement. Uh, mostly we focus on gross interest income. That is the amount of income you get from your interest bearing uh, assets. So what you get from uh, loans, what you get from um, um, the bonds that you owe, things like that, and any interest expenses, what you have to pay out, your uh, interest on deposits, things like that. Thus, we get the net interest income or NII which is simply your gross interest income minus your gross interest expense. This is, tells us how much the bank is earning. They, remember, their main profit centers come from loans. Banks exist to lend money. If they are not making uh, money on their loans, we got a problem. We got a problem. Um, and banks that often try to make money in other ways through fees or uh, other kinds of behavior tend to uh, incur more risk. Banks can also get uh, income from non-interest areas, uh, say if they own uh, some property and are leasing it out, uh, things like that. Um, it's rarer, but it, of course it can happen. Sometimes banks will uh, foreclose on property, turn around and sell it. That'll be a non-interest expense. But most of their income does come from uh, interest. But what we end up getting is the pre-tax net income of a bank is your net interest income plus your anything outside of interest, any income outside, minus our non-interest expenses. This gives us an idea of the health of a bank. We can also look at uh, a couple of signals here in return on assets and return on equity. So your net, uh, your uh, pre-tax net income can be high, but um, analysts also look at return on assets and return on equity. Your return on asset is basically, not basically, it is defined as your net income divided by your total assets. Uh, very simple calculation, but it tells us a lot. If, for example, your net income are increasing, but your total assets are staying the same, then, you have, then you're having a higher return on assets. Uh, alternatively, if your net income is staying the same and your total assets are increasing, you're having a falling return on assets. 
there's a temptation here to try and build a rule that, oh, we want a higher return on assets uh, and avoid a lower one. That's not necessarily true. As with any ratio, as with any percentage, the devil is in the details. The devil is in the details. And uh, we as uh, budding entrepreneurs, as economists, whatever it is you choose to go into uh, post your nickel state career, you want to avoid relying on seemingly easy rules. Those tend to backfire. For example, we can have an increasing return on assets, but it actually signals danger for the bank. If your net income is rising and your total assets are staying the same, for example, well, how can that be? If your total assets are staying the same, then the amount of money we're lending out, for example, uh, is going to be flat. Your assets are not changing. But if your net income is increasing, that implies you're getting more uh, money from interest. Since higher interest rates, all else held equal, are equal to uh, higher risk, a increasing return on assets could imply that the bank is making more and more risky loans. Uh, a higher return on asset could actually be a danger sign for the bank that they're, they are increasing their risk exposure for the sake of getting more income. That can be a very, very risky strategy. Again, Silicon uh, Valley Bank, again, um, uh, Bear Stearns and a lot of the issues leading up to the financial crisis. Part of the reason that caught so many analysts off guard is because they were looking just at the return on assets number and saying, oh, look, these are increasing, not realizing or not digging into, hey, these are more risky loans. We got a big problem here. And unfortunately, that problem blew up in everybody's face. Uh, some decisions made by some analysts end up uh, making life difficult for everyone. Return on equity uh, is sort of a same issue. So the return on equity is your net income divided by your equity capital, how much owner's equity is in here. A higher return on equity can imply that equity is going further, but again, there are similar problems because you can have a higher ROE and have the bank undercapitalized. Uh, there's not enough equity to cover their assets, uh, equity plus liabilities to uh, adequately cover assets. And that can also signal danger for the bank. So the short, uh, the short bit uh, here is that we have various uh, things. We have interest rate accounts. We have or in, uh, income statements. Excuse me. We have income statements for the bank. We have return on assets, return on equity, uh, stock prices. There are all sorts of things that the analyst can look at to try and uh, noodle out the risk of the bank. You want, and this is true regardless of uh, what industry you're in, regardless of any kind of exploration that you are doing, you want your uh, you want to look at more than just one tool when making analysis. Just like you need more than a hammer to build a house, you will build a lot of a house with a hammer. However, you need saws, you need electrical equipment, you need all sorts of things to build a proper house beyond just a hammer. It's the same thing when doing any kind of analysis. Reliance on just a single statistic will get you burned. Uh, just uh, a personal story from when I was a consultant, uh, I did a lot of work in oil and gas. And in uh, 2015, uh, oil prices were rising steadily, rising steadily, rising steadily. Uh, the fracking industry was in full swing. Uh, the world was uh, enjoying relatively uh, a peaceful time. There was a lot of economic growth going on. And so the demand for oil remained relatively high and oil prices were rising. Uh, I had a client, an oil, um, oil rig manufacturer. They made the machinery for uh, oil derricks and rigs, things like that. They asked basically, hey, we have a chance to buy a rival. 
uh, should we do it? Or do you think there's a downturn in the oil uh, market coming? And my company, we looked at the demand side of things and we said, yes, we think this will be a good purchase for you. Oil should could oil prices should continue to rise and you'll be able to make your money back. One quarter later, so a mere three months after we said that, they sealed the deal and oil prices plummeted. They tanked. Uh, I think they went something from $60 a barrel to 30. It was a huge drop. And uh, this company very quickly lost a lot of money on their deal and they had to lay people off. I had to go out to Tulsa, Oklahoma uh, because I was their, the representative to the company. I had to go out to Oklahoma face the wrath of the CEO who just lost a billion dollars and uh, face the wrath of lots of people who are losing their jobs because of my bad call, because of my company's bad call. We were only looking at the demand side, but as you know, supply and demand, the supply side, what we should have been looking at was oil reserves were going up and up and up and up and eventually the price crashed. So that's just a long way of saying all these statistics are important. They help us analyze risk. Uh, but you want to look at the whole picture. What is really going on with the return on assets? What is really going on with the return on equity? You got to dig deep. You got to dig deep. You got to look down. If banks are making more and more on fees, uh, what is that signaling? Are there regulations that are pushing them away from, say, safer interest uh, bearing assets into more risky bearing? We need to look at the whole holistic picture, not simply just the three statistics that we were talking about. And so with that, we'll end the lecture here. Uh, this was way shorter. We actually probably could have gotten through this on Wednesday, but uh, it, it is what it is. I will see you guys on this upcoming Wednesday where we will briefly introduce our next topic and then we'll spend the second half or so of class uh, doing review for the upcoming exam on November, uh, sorry, not Monday, November 6th, uh, November 8th, November 8th, which is what it should say on Canvas. So with that, I hope uh, everybody has a good time. Uh, I'll see you all um, next week.